This week in the Rochester Press Box from Salvador's Pizzeria at the historic Garage Door Restaurant. Hi, I'm Sal Mayoran, and I'm going to tell you all about my opinion on Marcel Darius and how I can't believe he wasn't in shape at the start of Bill's training camp. NFL coming to L.A. It is starting to gain traction. I'll tell you why. I'm Mike Catalano. Doc Rivers has a right to his opinion. He just could have had it about a year ago. And I'm Bill Puckle with our cultural aversion to ties. Join us in the Rochester Press Box this week. The Rochester Press Box is brought to you by Salvatore's at the Garage Door. Rochester's choice winner for best pizzeria, featuring Wacky Wing Wednesday and the Super Slice. It's as big as your head. The games are always on at the Garage Door, home to the Rochester Press Box. Hello everyone and thanks for joining us here in the Rochester Press Box from Salvador's Pizzeria at the Historic Garage Door Restaurant. I'm Bill Pucko, joined by John DiTullio, WHTK. Bill, it's great to be here. <laughs> Mike Cat I don't even know why he's laughing. And Mike Catalana from 13 Wham News. I'm happy to be part of the Blue Blazer Brigade. Yes. Well, I'm a little left out. That's but right. Sal's in style as he is always. Oh. Sal Mayron, a Democrat and Chronicle uh, football reporter, knows everything about the Buffalo Bills. And with the Bills reporting to camp this week, uh, everybody wants to know what your early projections, the kind of things you expect to see from this team and some of the things you're looking for while they're at St. John Fisher. Well, Billy, competence would be one thing I want to see at St. John Fisher, which we haven't seen a whole lot of in the last 14 years. But I, I do think they're a better team. I like the roster. It's probably, we were having a talk the other day with some guys, and I think the old 3 team might have been the most talented team we've seen at Fisher down the roster, but this one's right there. This one's probably the second or third most talented roster. Now, whether they can come through and, and, and you know play well and win games this year, I don't know. But I think there's talent there if they can stay healthy, um, but it all comes down to one guy. We all know who that guy is, E.J. Manuel. Yeah. Mike, you're seeing as much of the team as Sal is, actually, so yeah. what do you think? Well, I, I agree with Sal. I think they have the talent on that team, like last year. It's a little bit different, maybe a little bit better this year to win. Five or six games, that's what that talent level will do. The quarterback will be the difference between, is it going to be six, is it going to be seven, eight, nine, where can they go? Because last year, I think they played the entire season with rarely having an advantage at quarterback. Maybe they played even with some teams, slightly better in some other games, but rarely did they go into a game where the quarterback did it for them. That's why they won six games instead of nine or ten. I think it's expected, and it should be, come December, the Bills should be in contention for one of the two wild card spots in the AFC. I think that's realistic. But with Sal and Mike and I'll piggyback, it comes down to number three. If number if, if the Bills are in contention in December, he's having a pretty good year. If they're out of contention, it tells me two things. He stinks or he's hurt. That's basically what the season really comes down to. As Sal said, the roster is built to make a run at the playoffs. I don't think there's any doubt about that. If Manuel progresses the way Doug Marone and Doug Whaley feel, then they should be in contention come December. That's okay. all. That's I think that's fair expectations. Can I? I want to add one more thing about the quarterbacks. I don't know if Sal agrees with this. I'm seeing Jeff Tool start to get some second team snaps, and I don't think that's because Jeff Tool has been so great. I think Thad Lewis is showing that he's Thad Lewis. My concern for this team is. I'm not talking about EJL for a long period of time. I'm talking about maybe a game or two. When you're talking about being this close and maybe being there, I mean, I think EJ can play and has potential to play, but beyond him, I'm really concerned with that, and I would have loved to have seen some veteran in there. And I, I don't know about Mike, those two guys behind you. That really is, the, for me, the number one concern with this team. Because I think if you look at their, their three-man quarterback depth, it might be the worst in the NFL. Yeah. Really, when you consider Manuel only played 10 games last year as a rookie, and he was erratic when he played, and then they had two guys behind him who really just weren't very good. And I don't think Jeff Toole and Thad Lewis are all that much better this year. I was really surprised that Whaley didn't go out and do something in the offseason. Either draft a guy and you know give a guy a chance, or get a veteran guy yeah. to come in there in case Manuel, with three injuries, gets hurt. You know, that was the one place they whiffed. Is it ego? Do they just want to prove all of us wrong that Tool and Lewis are capable and they can win football games? Because I'm wondering, yeah. how do they not bring in somebody who has actually started more than, say, three or four NFL right. games in their career? It's Jeff Tool and Thad Lewis. Oh. They, Thad Lewis fell into their lap because he was cut in Detroit and they needed somebody desperately. And Jeff 
Tool was an undrafted guy. It's not like it was some draft pick. They went out and got this guy, and they said, we're going to make it work that he was there. Uh, maybe there's a plan at some point, but you'd need it. Even a veteran's got to come in at some point. Uh, I think that could be that red flag. At a certain point, things are going well. EJ's out two or three yep. weeks, and it caves in the season. Yeah, but that's probably a good sign. If we're spending any time talking about who the backup quarterback's going to be, it means there's fewer, maybe there's fewer problems out there generally. Uh, this is the Rochester Press Box, and we'll be back. President Obama was at the Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum in Cooperstown this week. These are drunken, young knuckleheads. Uh, they just have too much going against them. Kelly Johnson's not the answer at first base. <laughs> I like him this past week. I hated him. Is he the best player in the National League right now? Absolutely, 100%. And this is such a great story, the story that keeps on giving. There are those who look at things the way they are and ask why. I dream of things that never were and ask why not. Welcome back to the Rochester Press Box here from Salvador's Pizzeria at the Historic Garage Door Restaurant. A uh, big week in the Salvador's family of foods. There is a now a fifth Arthur Treacher's that has opened up in Spencerport. We're all pretty excited about that. Gambling and sports. John, uh, you know, you've done this thing. Berkeley Breen broke the story for Channel 10. Sure. The Thomas Vanek has been in town under uh, less than ideal circumstances. This is potentially serious. It hasn't garnered any traction nationally, which I'm somewhat surprised. You've got, you know, let's face it, a, a pretty good player, high profile player, at least he's with the Sabres now in Minnesota, being called in to testify on the prosecution's behalf about a gambling ring going on where you used to play, at least in the area. Uh, from what we know, from what we understand, he didn't bet on hockey, but I gotta believe Gary Bettman and his people and I think got to be uh, the, uh, the people in Minnesota. It's just got to be saying, all right, this. I think you're starting to tread on a, a very, very dangerous area. Anytime a professional athlete is linked to gambling, there is major, major issues. And I think they're coming for Thomas Vanek, no and doubt about and it. It's like his sport or not, you know, hockey or whatever. I mean, we saw this. We're still debating this. How many years later about Pete Rose? Yeah, I think it's because it's hockey, and there's less yeah. interest in general Maybe. around the country in hockey, and. Maybe I'm wrong. Does anybody bet on hockey? Do you, do you bet on hockey? I mean, people must, right? I would bet on a game. So. I think it's more it by to be. are you getting the goal? What do people bet on? You're right, but in that case, I, and it's also, again, uh, isn't it? Wouldn't it be the most difficult game to influence as a player? I, I guess maybe that's why people aren't going. Hey, hold on. What about that? You know, Sabres game in '07 when they blew the three to one lead. I I don't think people are thinking that way. I think that's what's kept it from being a huge deal. If it was a member of the Bills or a member of the New York Yankees or even the Toronto Blue Jays, I think it would be a bigger deal in sports. Yeah. We don't see it in football though, Sal. I mean, did the way back, it's going way back, the yeah, Paul Horning and Alex Karras yeah. thing, did that kill it? I mean, did people realize this is serious? Well, I don't know if it killed it. I mean, don't forget, we've had scandals right along in, in college sports too. So I don't think it killed it completely, but I just think there's a whole, there's a much tighter lid on things now. And the NFL, like Mike said, no one's paying attention to the NHL. The NFL, they're really paying attention. Let's face it, gambling is a major part of, of this world when it comes to football. So I think they have the microscope even mm -hmm. sh shining brighter on NFL players to make sure they stay clear of it. If it was Ricky Rubio of the Minnesota Timberwolves, maybe it's an issue. But as Thomas Vanek of the Minnesota Wild, as Mike says, it's not. It's a non-story, at least nationally. But it goes right to the core. Yeah. I mean, John asked on his show, what's the more serious offense? steroids or gambling uh, and I'm the old school I guess I think I think the gambling issue just goes right to the heart of the sport and it's still if, something serious right if you believe there was any influence on the play yeah. either on the ice or on the field or on the court the other impacts that actual play and I think that's why a lot of people well, might lean more towards gambling steroids. may influence a handful of games PEDs influence an entire season. Yeah. I think that's the dichotomy. You're talking about 160, 82 games in the NHL as opposed to maybe four or five games. What's the difference? It's a big difference when you're talking about PEDs. No, I think we're going to see this, uh, the whole Vanek thing hit, hit national news this week. I mean, it's got to pop soon. Like it or not, when we return.
Welcome back to the Rochester Press Box here from Salvatore's Pizzeria at the Historic Garage Door Restaurant. Wacky Wings Wednesday. Uh, the calzones, right? Big as your head? The meat lovers of calzone the pizza. is the best deal going. This thing is about this. It's ginormous, <laughs> and you got to be a real man. Our food expert. To try to finish this thing. And I don't know. I know I can do it. I'm not quite sure if the rest of the panel can Tremendous help. sports bar, and we're, and we're sneaking up on trivia season. Trivia starts Thursday night for the opener. This is top A grade A top-notch trivia. One of the best trivias in the country happening right here. All right, like it or not. Mike, let me go to you first. Uh, Tony Dungy's comments. You know, I, he's got a backtrack and he's trying to say that the time of his comments about not wanting Michael Sam because of the distraction came during the whole Oprah thing. Tony Dungy does have to realize that every comment he makes in that form go back to what he has publicly stated about his religious beliefs and that impacts that. If he was a different coach and a different person and did not, never talked about that, I think it could be looked at more as strictly a football thing, where a former coach goes, I don't like distractions, I don't want it, no different. He came out in public support of Michael Vick, he's come out in public support of Tim Tebow and bringing him in, and now he says he wouldn't want Michael Sam. I, I, I don't know exactly what it was, I think there's some miscommunication or at least misinterpretation of when he said it I don't really like it I think if you're gonna make those comments you make a full comment with context or you don't say anything at all I mean he, he has to right as part of his persona did he sit down and talk with Michael has he watched tape on Michael Sam I'm assume so did he sit down and have an interview with Michael Sam if he did all that and said I, st I still wouldn't take him then I'm okay with that but I want to know that Tony Dungy vetted him I know he's going to be anywhere between a fourth or a seventh round pick. Maybe he talked to him, and after talking with him, he would say no. But I don't. I don't think he could just make an idle comment like I wouldn't. I don't want the distraction. I can see where there is now criticism of Tony Dungy because it's Tony Dungy for crying out loud. Yeah. He said, like it or not, uh, well, we have the advantage this year of the Buffalo Bills being the first NFL team to break camp. We had celebrity reporters coming in. All the guys from ESPN, Peter King was here, Sal Palantonio. So like it or not, celebrity reporters. Do you like any of these guys? I don't consider them celebrities. I consider them, you know, <laughs> just like me. They're comrades of mine. I mean, they're on TV and they've got a more bigger, a bigger following than any of us. But I'm fine with it. I, I like the fact that Peter King came in and Sal Pal was here with Jaws and ESPN brought their set. Fine, the Bills need stuff like that. The Bills have been irrelevant for almost 15 years now. So I don't mind at all that they get to be the first team in training camp this year and there is some attention focus. And let's face it, Sammy Watkins has become a lightning rod for attention. The Bills made a bold move to go up and get him. He's a dynamic player and he happened to have his best day in camp when the cameras were rolling. So good for them, good for the Bills, and I'm, I'm all for the guys coming to town. It bothers me when they say they've got this granite of an offensive line. It's okay. It's a good line. And Scott Chandler is, I don't know, the next Dave Casper. <laughs> I mean, Scott Chandler being out, being back, is somehow going to get the Bills. I, I, it bothers me when I hear national guys talk about this great offensive line and a great tight end, which I think they have neither. Yeah. It just bothers me. That's yeah, all. I'm not saying I believe what they say. Yeah. I just don't mind having them around. Hey, well, I, see, I it's kind of interesting because yes. you guys, all three of you guys, know more about the Buffalo Bills than any of these guys you know, as well-read or researched as they are. Uh, so, like, are, there, are they posers? I mean, do you resent them at all coming in no, here? I don't Pretending they way. know more than they know. No, I don't in that way. And I think, honestly, sometimes that perspective maybe is a good thing from a little bit of a distance. But in the end, yeah, they go went overboard a little bit talking about the O-line. It's the first week at camp, so most yeah. people are going to be more on the positive side, unless you watched them practice the last couple well, the of days. Was they went over on the old line before they went into pads, so the yes. defense wasn't actually coming after the quarterback in, until we saw at that point. Time. But they all say the same thing that we do about EJ. Yeah. You know, they may like this, that, and the other about him, but he's got to get better. This has to improve. That has to improve. And their season's going to come down to EJ. Johnny, like it or not, deadline, baseball deals. Well, the Yankees, I thought, made a pretty good move the other day getting Chase Headley. Uh, it, it, I don't know. It depends on who you're rooting for. If you're a Tampa Bay Rays fan, you're playing pretty well right now. They're in the hunt now for that wild card. So I think David Price stays in Tampa, right? I think that's the big move we're all keeping an eye on. And what kind of moves will the Yankees make at the deadline? I don't know what they can do. But Chase Headley, for what they gave up, I think is an actually pretty good move on the part of Brian Cashman. They need some punch at third base. See, I never much cared for the reshuffling of the deck that late in the season. It always kind of bothered me. Yeah, unless you're making like a single move, or though that's considered a relatively minor, but those kind of moves can happen. You know the move I always go back to, you know, those, those trades like that, I go back to, wasn't it John Smoltz for Doyle Alexander? 
And yeah. at the time, yes. it really worked. Now, I'm not saying Solardi is a great player, but I'm saying it really worked in the short term for the Tigers. And then in the long term, I think they might have rather had him back. So sometimes you make this deal like, oh, it's just a minor leaguer. you yeah. got to watch out who well, that minor leaguer is. The one they is. always talk about in Boston is they, for some reliever whose name I can't remember, they gave up Jeff Bagwell, who was in double A, yeah. you know, borderline Hall of Famer in a, in a deadline deal. Uh, unfinished business when we return. President Obama was at the Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum in Cooperstown this week. These are drunken, young knuckleheads. Uh, they just have too much going against them. And Kelly Johnson's not the answer at first base. <laughs> I like him this past week. I hated him. Is he the best player in the National League right now? Absolutely, 100%. And this is such a great story, the story that keeps on giving. There are those who look at things the way they are and ask why. I dream of things that never were and ask why not. Welcome back to the Rochester Press Box here from Salvador's Pizzeria at the Stork Garage Door Restaurant, our favorite segment, Unfinished Business. John. You know, this past week, the city of Los Angeles was brought up not once, but twice. The commissioner, Roger Goodell of the NFL, is deciding where to put the draft next year in spring of 2015. One city is Chicago. The other city, not Pittsburgh, not Green Bay, not even Dallas, but a city that doesn't even have NFL, at least for now, that would be L.A., Let's read between the lines. And then the other story came out that the NFL is actually considering building, that's right, building a stadium in L.A. to attract a current team or, at the risk of breaking their own rules, expansion. He, we here in Western New York are so worried who's going to buy the Bills and what's going to happen with the Buffalo Bills after their lease is up or after 2020. L.A. is now back in play as far as I'm concerned with the NFL draft and the fact that the NFL will actually run the stadium in L.A. I think it's worrisome for all of us here that they'll in fact shell out over a billion dollars to build the stadium when in fact if they shelled out half of that money, Buffalo, Western New York, it would be a lot that the Bills would stay here forever. Yeah, unspoken you know, support yeah. for L.A. has become very much spoken. L.A. for the NFL draft? That's a major blunder, but it's, there's an ulterior motive there. There's no doubt about it. So what do you got for us? Now, the Bills checked into training camp last week at this time, and Marcel Darius was unable to pass his conditioning test. Alan Branch didn't pass it either, and, and Cordy Glenn, who had a medical condition, also didn't pass it. We'll give him a pass for not passing. Marcel Darius, there's no excuse. After the offseason that this guy had, being arrested twice in May, Coming off a year where in the last two weeks of the season, he was suspended twice by Coach Doug Marone for missing team meetings. It boggles my mind that this guy, from the end of June to the, to the middle of July, couldn't get himself back in shape to be on time for practice when the Bills open training camp. This is a guy who's a number three overall pick in 2011. Huge responsibility for this franchise, for that guy to come through on that defense. He made the Pro Bowl as an alternate last year, and you thought maybe he got it back on track. But this offseason, and now coming to camp out of shape and being unable to participate, there's no excuse for that. And i got to really wonder, moving forward, how dedicated this kid is. And I know Doug Whaley said the other day when he was asked about it, yeah, it is a concern. So this kid's got to get back on track. And I kind of wonder, is it possible, guys, for him to do it? So how close are we, you think, to declaring this a, a busted draft pick? Well, not yet, because he is still a productive player on the field. He's, all of his problems have been off the field, really. I mean, he's been, he's been a, a good player for the Bills. He needs to be a great player, but he's been a very good player. But at this point, I'm not ready to give up on him. There's too much potential yeah. there. But really, one more transgression off the field, I don't think they give him a second contract. And I think it's annoyed his teammates. And I'm hearing rumblings a little off camera from guys that are just tired of his act a little bit. That would be a good thing. Push him from inside the team, and maybe yeah. that'll have him react. All right, I want to talk about somebody different. I want to talk about Doc Rivers. Look, it's a mess what's going on with Donald Sterling in L.A., and everybody wishes at this point he's going to get $2 billion that he's going to walk away, and eventually the team goes into the new ownership. But I'm hearing Doc Rivers with the threat, at least from people in the NBA, saying if Sterling is not gone, I am out, and I'm not going to coach this team. It would be nice if Doc Rivers knew who Donald Sterling was when he worked his way out of Boston, got out of there to take a great opportunity in L.A. and get the job. 
Of course he knew who Donald Sterling was. Maybe he didn't have that recording of Donald Sterling. Maybe he didn't have that final proof that everybody would know about it. But you're taking a $5 million a year job in L.A. to work with the Clippers. You know who Donald Sterling is. And now Doc is not happy. Could it be a coincidence that the team in the same building, the L.A. Lakers, still haven't hired a coach yet and maybe Doc could move from one franchise to another and eventually convince some of the players on the Clippers to move with him? That's always a possibility, too. I think Doc has the right to be upset at what goes on with the ownership, but he can't be blind to what he walked into before everybody else knew about Donald Sterling. Donald Sterling was no secret to the NBA, and he shouldn't have been to Doc Rivers either. Yeah, Rivers has clout, still has, and uh, it's nice, that, at least even if it's a little too late, that he seems willing to use it. You know, uh, we have, I got this from Wikipedia, so you know it's true. Americans have a cultural aversion to ties. Abby Wambach was sitting in Sal's seat last week, and she actually agreed when the, we went over some of the things that could be done to make soccer a little more acceptable in the United States. Uh, is eliminating ties. There's 19 teams in MLS. Of the 19 teams, only two of those teams have won more than half their games, which means all the rest of those games are sending both sides away unhappy. That has to be fixed. We have a cultural aversion to ties. Eliminating ties in soccer would be a great first step to making the sport a little more acceptable, I think, in the United States. We record the Rochester Press Box here from Salvador's Pizzeria every Wednesday afternoon at 1230. We always invite you to come down here, have lunch, meet the guys. John, thanks. Good job Billy. as always. Michael, good, good to be back. Sal, keep up the good work out in the football right. field. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week.